loves me like a river Somebody like a flowing stream Somebody loves me like a river Somebody and it ain't a dream Sometimes I'm tired and weary Don't care what's going on But the river says to me, dearie Don't you ever stop flowing on I'm not the spring of the river I don't want to be the endless sea I just want to be the humble river bank Let the water flow through me Somebody, Somebody loves me like a river, river Somebody like a flowing stream Somebody loves me like a river Somebody and it ain't a dream Somebody loves me like a river Somebody like a flowing stream Somebody loves me like a river Somebody and it ain't a dream Somebody, Somebody like loves me like a river Somebody like a flowing stream Somebody like the water like a river Somebody and it ain't a dream Sometimes I carry water to the river Pour it in and say Thank you, Lord. I know that some, somebody, somebody loves me like a river. Somebody like a flowing stream. Somebody loves me like a river. Somebody and it ain't a dream. Somebody loves me like a river. Somebody like a flowing stream Somebody like the water like a river Somebody and it ain't a dream Good morning. Welcome to worship with Helena United Methodist Ministries. We are two United Methodist churches collaborating and cooperating in ministry together. I'm Pastor Sammy Pack Toner, and St. Paul's and Covenant Churches are honored that you have joined us this morning from wherever you are. We celebrate Pride Month every month here. We believe that all people are God's beloved children and all are welcome into the fullness of our congregation. We have many ways to stay connected during this time. There is a digital attendance sheet. You'll find the link in the description of this video. You can also greet each other in the chat box as you watch worship. On our website, humchurch.org, that's H-U-M-M, church.org, you'll find a place to submit prayer requests and subscribe to our bi-weekly email blasts, plus many other updates and previous sermons. As Montana is now into phase two of reopening, we have a few shifts that we'd like you to be aware of. Our online worship on Sundays will continue as they are. Our office is now open from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Masks are required to be in the building, but we do have some there for you to use, so please come by and see us. Small groups are allowed to meet again with limited space and times, so please contact Angie at the office. Her email is office at stpaulshelena.org to schedule your new room and your new time. And weather permitting, we'll be meeting on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. for our summer campfire meetings. We will be sharing stories, having communion, and just getting to chat with one another and be in the same place. Check the link below for registration. This coming week, we'll be on the Covenant lawn and sharing stories about summer camp. Youth, you'll be meeting at the RV drive-in to grab snacks before the campfire meeting, so contact Dominic for details. We have a special event today at 2 p.m. The George Harper Good News Series lecture will be going virtual this summer. We are hosting J.J. Warren, who is an author and advocate for the LGBTQ plus rights in the religious realm. JJ will be speaking about the future of the United Methodist Church and strengthening the connection of inclusive churches around the world. Join us at 2 p.m. today on Zoom 
The link is below and you can email me with questions. So welcome. Welcome to this time set apart, no matter if you are joining us on Sunday or any other time. There is a love that never ceases, a hope that cannot be quenched, and a pursuit for justice no matter the cost. These are the things of God. Let us now enter into worship. It is wonderful to be with you today and to have this opportunity to pray together. We have been given minds to know, hearts to love, and voices to praise our living God. Praying together draws our hearts and souls closer to each other and to God. As members of the community of faith, please join me in the unison prayer displayed on the screen. Loving God, on this day you sent your spirit so that you could abide with us always comforting us, guiding us, convicting us, and filling us with life, you gave your spirit to every person of every tongue and every nation, so that all may know your love and be gathered into your embrace. We confess that we do not always embody your radical, inclusive spirit. We build barriers based on race, gender, orientation, and ability, and we have woven these barriers into our laws, our cultures, and our daily lives. Empower us through the power of your spirit to tear down the walls we've built, to heal those that we have wounded, and to shout the worth of each person to the world with the same holy fire that you gave your disciples in Jerusalem and through which you gave birth to your church. Amen. Our hearts are lifted by joyous by life celebrations and burdened by its challenges. I invite you now to bring these joys and concerns as silent prayers before our loving God. Lord, hear our prayers. Gracious God, thank you for this wonderful community and for our pastors who lead us through these difficult times. We pray for people here and around the world who are sick or troubled and for those who are helping and healing. Help us to reshape our world to look more like heaven where all are equal, regardless of skin color or gender or sexual orientation. Help us to see the divine in friend and foe alike. Guide us to love and to peace and to justice. We pray now as we've been taught the prayer of our Lord, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, kids. This is Pastor Margaret here. And today we're going to be talking about the golden rule, which I think many of you know about and also the platinum rule so gather around and see you in just a minute Today, as we talk about the golden rule and the platinum rule, I want to take us on a field trip first so that we can learn about gold and platinum. They are both what we call precious metals because they are hard to find and they are valuable and we use them to make beautiful things like jewelry. So come on with me and we're gonna go meet Mr. Corey Johnson, who's the jeweler at Eaton Turner. See you in a minute. So this is Mr. Corey at Eaton Turner Jewelers and he's gonna to talk to us about gold and platinum. So what can you tell us about these two metals? Well, as, when it comes to metals, um, there's different reasons you would use them in jewelry. Um, white gold has, um, is, comes from um, gold, just like this does here. This is gold. You see that gold color. It's generally um, yellow. And um, in jewelry, they mix alloys of other metals to make it um, a different color or make it wearable and not so soft because gold comes very soft out of the ground. Um, platinum is um, naturally a white color and it is used in jewelry um, nearly pure, five, 95 to 90 percent pure in, in um, metals that are worn in jewelry, whereas gold is generally about um, half. 14 karat gold is a little over half gold, half other alloys, but you can do 18 karat and so on. Um, so what's an alloy? Um, it is um, other metals, um, copper, uh, zinc, uh, nickel, that sort of thing um, to create some hardness and wearability for the jewelry. Um, the other thing is, is um, Gold melts at a much lower temperature than platinum. That's probably one of the biggest differences. Uh, gold melts a little over 1600 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, whereas platinum melts closer to 32, a little over 32, so almost twice as hot to actually melt platinum. Um, so when we, when we make jewelry here in the store, we do something called casting, and the temperature is so hot and the process is so difficult that there are companies that do that specifically um, for platinum. Um, as far as wearability, wearability goes, um, platinum is heavier, it's more dense, so it will move the metal, but it won't wear away as quickly. Whereas white gold and yellow gold in the form wearing jewelry, it will actually wear away a little more quickly. So as opposed to moving, that hardness, when it wears on clothes and fabric and things of your daily wear, it'll actually wear away a little more quickly. That's why they say platinum lasts longer and is more durable over time. Um, if you compare white gold and platinum and, and consider which one you would wear for jewelry, um, another aspect to that is platinum you would just need to polish and it always stays a, a white color. White gold would not because it came from gold out of the ground in a yellow color, so that's why they will add um, different alloys. Those alloys 
to the metal to make it um, more white. But they can never make it totally white, so it's just a, um, an off-white. And we do what's called uh, rhodium plating on it. And that's um, done to bring out a really bright white finish, but it's just over the surface. So to keep it up, it needs to be done periodically, half a, between half a year and a year, people will have it re-rhodiumed. Um, and rhodium is in the platinum family, actually. So they put rhodium right on the ring in, in white gold. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for yeah. explaining to us. You bet. Wow, wasn't that so interesting? So, like I said before, we're going to talk about the golden rule, which I think all of you know. So maybe you can say it with me. The golden rule is do unto others as you would have done unto you, right? And from what we just learned from Mr. Corey about platinum, we heard that it is really, really strong. It's much stronger than gold. And we also heard that it takes a lot to melt platinum so that a jeweler can work with it. In fact, it takes almost two times as much heat to make it melt. And so knowing that platinum is stronger and more resilient and lasts longer, what do you think the platinum rule might be that's different from the golden rule? Maybe the big kids want to think of guesses too. All right, I'll tell you. The platinum rule is do unto others as they would have done unto them. <gasps> what do you know? So how do you know what people want? How do you know what they might want done unto them? I mean, you could just watch. Like if I wanted to find out what somebody's favorite color was, I could like watch and see what color clothes do they wear? What color is their school backpack or their lunchbox or shoes? Maybe those might tell me what their favorite color is, but that would take a long time. What's the fastest way to find out? Oh, right, ask them, absolutely. So here at church, we talk a lot about wanting to be kind to others, that that's one of the ways that we love other people, the way Jesus taught us to. And the platinum rule is another way of loving people, especially loving people in the ways that Jesus taught by actually asking people, what do you want? What do you need? Do you need my help? I'd be happy to help you. And what would actually be helpful to you? So when we ask, that is a way of loving people in a very special way. And so I invite you to remember both the golden rule and the platinum rule. So before we go, will you pray with me? Dear God, we are so grateful for all the ways you love us and help us to love others. Amen.
I'm Pastor Anna Velen, and our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, and verses 16 through 17. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew, Bethesda, which has five porticos. And these lay many invalids, blind and lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat and walk. And at once the man was made well, and he took up his mat, and began to walk. Therefore the Pharisees started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. A couple of years ago, my husband and I took a trip to Iceland. I absolutely loved it there. It is a positively gorgeous country full of fjords and glaciers and waterfalls and cute little seaside towns. It's saturated in history. It's the place where Vikings once walked and sailed and conquered. And Icelanders are some of the nicest people I've ever met. All of them gladly spoke English to tourists. They were helpful in showing us around and eager to give us advice on where to go next. Iceland and its people have a special place in my heart and they probably always will. And this is why I was especially disappointed some years after my trip when Iceland made the news for a scientific achievement of theirs. As a CBS headline proclaimed, Iceland is on track to eliminate Down syndrome. If you don't know, Down syndrome is a genetic disorder caused by the presence of an extra chromosome. It causes things like a distinct facial appearance, a short stature, and other physical markers, as well as atypical development or speech patterns. Iceland introduced prenatal screenings in the early 2000s, which scanned babies in utero for possible defects or abnormalities. And this news segment reported that since the advent of prenatal testing, nearly all women who received a positive Down syndrome test terminated their pregnancies. The scientists and the healthcare providers behind the development were praised for working towards their country's healthier future. Now, before I go any further, please note that I do not intend to make this a pro-life versus pro-choice debate. Rather, this is discussion about how we as a society talk about and treat people with disabilities. We need only to look at the language used in this article to see that this is an issue. Words like eliminate and eradicate, like what we did with polio or measles or some other deadly disease. Yet I have never once walked away from an interaction with someone with Down syndrome thinking that they were a plague. Quite the opposite. While people with Down syndrome do struggle with some of the things that come easily to most of us, they can still live full, happy lives with the right resources. And all of the people with Down syndrome that I've met have families and friends that love them just the way they are. From the workplace to the classroom and everywhere in between, members of the disability community encounter discrimination on a regular basis. They are frequently misjudged, denied opportunities and resources that they need, and at times outright ridiculed. Even when discrimination isn't malicious or blatant, any wheelchair user who has ever tried to get into a building without a ramp and every child with a learning disability in a mainstream classroom and any amputee shopping for clothes will tell you that the world just isn't built for people who don't fit the mold. And the church, unfortunately, is not immune to this. We have all attended churches that claim to be welcoming to all, but did all of them have wheelchair ramps or places that are accessible to folks with mobility aids? Many churches set up crying rooms for parents to soothe fussy babies, but don't know what to do when the crying babies grow up into crying autistic children with sensory overload. Ableism can even be found in our beloved United Methodist hymnal. The text for the most famous Methodist hymn of 4,000 Tongues to Sing still uses archaic offensive words like dumb to describe muteness and lame to describe physical disabilities. 
I am also disabled. I have several learning disabilities, ADHD, a sensory processing disorder, and mental illnesses. I love the church. It has nurtured me throughout my life, and now it's where I'm living out my calling. But while I have felt affirmed and accepted in this particular community, I'd be lying if I said that I have never been treated unfairly because of my diagnoses. My story and my experiences are not normative, but I can say that I know what it's like to feel as though your body is broken. That broken bodies don't have a place in Christ's body. The gospel, however, convinces me otherwise. In this morning's scripture reading, Jesus comes upon a pool containing miraculous waters. Many flock to the pool in the hopes of healing their various maladies, and one man in particular is there who has been ill for 38 years. Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? Disabled people and those that love them often read passages like this and come away frustrated, understandably asking where their miraculous healing is. I know that I've been one of them. These stories are also weaponized against people with disabilities and used to undergird harmful theologies. John 5, verse 6 in particular, is a popular one. Do you want to be made well? Jesus asks. This theology suggests that a sick or disabled person would be healed if they truly wanted it enough, and if they asked Jesus in full faith to be healed. Now, I don't believe that God operates that way. When Jesus asks the man if he wants to be made well, take note of the man's response. The man does not say yes. Instead, he tells Jesus his story about being ignored and isolated by the people around him. As rampant as ableism still is in our society, this man would have had it much worse. Jesus' contemporaries often blame disabilities on sufferers' sins or the sins of their parents. Frequently in the Gospels, they are seen begging on street corners alone. I am sure that this man is in pain. He has been gravely ill for longer than I have been alive. I am sure that this man, languishing on the shores of this healing pool, did want to be healed. But he doesn't say, yes, Jesus, please heal me. I'm in so much pain and I want to walk. Instead, he talks about how he's been discarded by his society. And all of that bears down on him just as much as, if not more than in some ways, the physical pain he is feeling. And Jesus does heal this man, but it's not just to take his pain away. At least I don't think so. In the Gospels, physical healing is wrapped in liberation. Amos Young, a professor of theology at Fuller Theological Seminary, remarks that the purpose of miraculous healing was not to fix what is broken, but to liberate those living in a society that was pitted against them. Young writes, In Jesus' world, the blind, the paralyzed, and the disabled were social outcasts, and hence they may have placed their primary hope for reincorporation into the society in their physical healing. Jesus himself is very clear about the fact that the society this man lives in is broken. When the Pharisees scold him for healing on the Sabbath, Jesus fires back at them. And as he does time and time again in the scriptures, he criticizes the rigid rules that keep the hurting from help and the marginalized from liberation. This man is not a problem. The society that marginalizes him is. The fact that this man cannot walk is not the main issue, but the fact that there is no place for him in their society is. The fact that he was ill is not the issue, but that no one is there to help him reach the pool and ease his pain. The fact that Jesus is healing on the Sabbath isn't the issue, but the fact that the keepers of the law seem to think that their rules can stop God from liberating those that oppress is. In contrast to ancient times, Young observes that in our world, such individuals may not require healing as much as other forms of social and technological accommodations. And this is true. Luckily, disabled people now have accommodations to help them move more easily through their society and engage in the world that they live in. And our understanding of disability has shifted from the able-bodied have grown in compassion for people with disabilities. Still, this doesn't mean that those with disabilities are not still marginalized. Just like the man in today's passage, disabled people do not need liberation from their bodies or from who they are, but from societal standards that deem them us, 
me broken. Yes, disabilities cause pain and struggle. I know that if a healing pool suddenly popped up, I and many of my disabled friends would go and do it at full speed. But despite the problem of pain, God makes each of us, endows each of us with a sacred image and calls our bodies good. Not bad, not less than, not broken. Making things accessible for people in wheelchairs or using crutches isn't convenient, isn't inconvenient, but they are inconvenienced every single day of their lives. Children with learning disabilities aren't problem children, but the fact that many of their parents have to fight school districts just to access the services they need to succeed, that's a problem. People with mental illnesses aren't crazy or weak. On the contrary, living in a world where you can call in sick from work when you have the flu but can't call in depressed when you can't get out of bed in the morning requires a level of strength that most cannot fathom. And babies with Down syndrome are not a plague, but a world that would rather eliminate them than give them what they need in order to thrive is a very sick world indeed. As the body of Christ, we are called to be builders of the kingdom of God, a kingdom where everyone is accepted and valued and respected equally regardless of how their bodies look or work or how their brains function. If disabled people aren't the ones that need fixing, how can we fix our church and our world instead? We can start with some practical pieces. We can make sure our places of business and worship and leisure are accessible to our mobility challenged neighbors. We can look critically at the healthcare system and the education system, how they often fail people with disabilities. And we can find ways to fix how they are. And we can make sure that there are ways for visually or hearing impaired to interact meaningfully in our worship services. And there's a place for small changes too. Perhaps we might consider using words other than crazy or stupid to describe people we dislike. We can think about omitting lines from our hymnal that use words like dumb or lame. We can say using a wheelchair instead of wheelchair bound or using the phrase died by suicide rather than committed suicide when someone takes their life. These might seem like small fixes, but as we've learned, language is powerful. Maybe we can give the mother of the screaming child in Target the benefit of the doubt, because we know that while autistic meltdowns can look a little bit like a tantrum, it's not the same thing. Most importantly, we can ask the disabled loved ones in our lives about their needs and their opinions. Listen to our stories the way that Jesus listened to the man by the pool and ask what you can do to make our lives easier. But part of healing our world from ableism is hard work. It lies in cultivating a willingness to see where our systems and ways of being are broken and see the disabled as whole people with gifts and graces to contribute. There is a wonderful concept in the autism community called presuming competence. It means to approach autistic people assuming that they can think and learn and understand. I believe that this can extend to how we treat all disabled people. We can assume that they, we, are children of God who are competent and capable and called and have things to contribute to the world. The church especially is called to this mission. And I have seen the church answer this call so beautifully. I've heard the testimonies of disabled people who after years of rejection and discrimination found purpose and healing in sharing their gifts with their church community. I've worked in a church where a family with a deaf son created a thriving deaf ministry complete with ASL interpretation at every Sunday service. I've sat in a church where recovering addicts and disabled veterans and paranoid schizophrenics and people of all abilities and disabilities serve communion to each other every week. And it's happened for me too. For most of my educational career, I hated school due in part to my learning difficulties. But when I went to seminary, my professors gave me the accommodations I needed to help me reach my full potential. Because of them, I felt smart and I felt capable for the first time. And I wouldn't be who I am today without them. 
Just as Jesus tells the Pharisees, God in heaven is still working. God is working in and through people of all abilities, binding us together into one big, beautiful body in Christ through which we'll heal the broken world around us. Many of you know that unfortunately, this is my last Sunday here with you at home. And while I'm sad to leave, I am coming away filled with hope for the future of the church. I've seen your desire and your commitment to welcome all people of all ages and genders and orientations and races and socioeconomic statuses and abilities as beloved children of God. And my prayer for this community is that you will continue as you always have been working to build God's kingdom and to create a place where all really means all. And thank you for empowering me and accepting me and for giving me the opportunity, the gift of being your pastor. Amen. We come now to our time for the offering in our morning worship service. And I invite you to consider the ways in which this ministry here in Helena, Montana is blessing you and your spiritual life. We invite you to give generously. Instructions will be on the screen for how to give through the website and directly in the mail. And as we prepare to respond to the gift of God's word and presence in our lives, I invite you to pray with me now. Holy One, you show us the way. You invite us to journey with you, to receive from you all the many blessings that you have for us, and to share them generously. We pray that the gifts we return now to you through our financial offerings, through the work of our hands, and the words of our mouths and the love of our hearts. We pray that you would magnify all of these gifts and that you would use them for the blessing of this community of faith and through us for the communities that we serve. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. And God be with you until we meet again. Beloved, this is the last Sunday of June. And as we have known for quite some time, that means it is the last Sunday that Pastor Anna Veland is with us. And so we want to take a moment to send Anna forth with a blessing. She will continue to serve 
the Lutheran Church in Townsend as she begins to take on a new form of training with clinical pastoral education. And we want to send her forth, wishing her well, knowing that she continues in God's love and grace. Blessings, Anna, each and every step of your journey. Go with our love, our faith in God, and also our faith in you. Be of good cheer.